Well, good morning and welcome back. It's uh, a uh, really nice Saturday morning in South Texas. I brought a load of Megan and Chase's belongings down to their new house, and this is their backyard. I'm gonna to be a test of my uh, ADD today because there's a highway right over there and there's plenty of cars, and so it, uh, it may challenge me to stay focused a little bit, but I hope you'll stay with me. Here we are a week from Resurrection Sunday, and uh, we'll be together in Darty next week, Lord willing, and have a sunrise service at about 7.30, and, uh, and then try to get back to some of the more traditional things that we do together as a church, and I'll, I'll let you know more about that as the week goes on. But uh, for today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27 this week before um, Easter, East before Resurrection Sunday, and uh, we're going to read a passage that um, is challenging for a lot of us because when we think about how well we follow Jesus, uh, sometimes we, we come up on the short end of the stick. There's Throughout history, there have been uh, military leaders, um, powerful politicians who have inspired their followers to follow them even to brave death for them and uh, for the sake of their cause. King David was one of those exceptional leaders. Genghis Khan, Peter the Great, Native American leaders like Geronimo and Tecumseh had followers that would follow them even to the brink of, if not death itself, uh, for the sake of whatever cause it was that they were, they were uh, proposing for their nations. There were even evil leaders that people followed, like Adolf Hitler and uh, Mao Zedong, and people followed them almost blindly, um, but with great conviction. And I, I'm convinced that part of that is because they were uh, great, passionate leaders, whether we agreed with their cause or not. They were great, passionate leaders, and so people would follow them. You know, when we think about Jesus and the people that followed Jesus, many of his followers were just that kind of follower. I mean, they would, they at least in mindset and thought, they would have followed him unto death. But then there were those that didn't. They followed in namesake, or they followed because he fed them, or he followed because they enjoyed the show of the miracles. It's kind of like those people that... Uh, sports fans who who root for whoever's winning you know it's not that they're dedicated to some particular sports team I you know I think of my my dear friends who are Dallas Cowboy fans to the end I'm telling you you know they're a Dallas Cowboy fan there's no question because they haven't jumped ship yet and probably should have anyway you understand what I'm saying there are those who are committed committed followers of something or someone and and they won't they won't relent this when we think about Jesus and what it means to be a real disciple we we really have to kind of ask ourselves what would a real disciple do when circumstances change when things get tough or in this case after Jesus has been crucified on a cross and he is dead and his lifeless body is hanging on a tree what does a real disciple do and so let's read together in Matthew chapter 27 begin at verse 57 as evening approached there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus going to Pilate he asked for Jesus's body and Pilate ordered that it be given to him Joseph took the body wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the time that we have together this morning. God, I pray that you will help to prepare our hearts as we face this week ahead of us as we prepare to celebrate the risen Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the love that you poured out for us and the care and the protection that you give us. God, I pray that we will be found followers of Christ 
like that of Joseph and Mary and Mary. Father, be with us as we study today. Let us hear from your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Discipleship characteristics that we that we learn from this story. One, we stand up for Jesus even if it involves great personal risk. In verse 57, the scripture tells us that as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Now, Joseph identified himself as a follower of Christ. By definition, that makes him a disciple. That is someone who is trying to learn from and emulate Jesus, a student of Christ. He was rich. He was powerful. Matthew admits this statement, but um, Mark calls him a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, that is the political structure of the day. Luke also identifies him as a member of the Sanhedrin and, and adds that he was a dissenting member of the group that wanted to have Jesus killed. And so he was, while powerful and rich and prominent in society, he was not part of the group that wanted Jesus uh, crucified. So he was um, in an environment where all of his social peers despised what Jesus was doing, and yet Joseph became a disciple. He followed Christ. The environment surrounding the crucifixion it would seem like that standing up for Christ the way Joseph did would have cost him everything. It would have cost him his standing in the Sanhedrin. It could have cost him his social prominence. It could have cost him his wealth. It could have cost him his life. And yet, when it came time for Jesus' body to come down off of that cross, instead of it being carried off to a dump somewhere to be burned like garbage, Joseph went to Pilate and asked for the body. You see, I think the lesson that we learn right there is that uh, a real disciple of Christ stands up for Jesus. It's not that he needs us to. Jesus doesn't need our defending. Jesus doesn't need our protection. In fact, it's the other way around. But at the same time, standing up for the cause of Christ, standing up for the church that Christ built, standing up for the principles of Scripture, that's, that's not always the most popular and in Joseph's case could have been even deadly. And so we have to kind of ask ourselves, what would we stand up for? I mean, what is worth dying for to you? When I think about it, I you know, there's, there's been several causes. Obviously, we would consider our families and say, you know, I would, I would die for my family. I have some friends that are very dear friends, and, and they know that I would take a bullet for them. They know that I would, I would stand up and die for them if necessary. It, you know, we just have to evaluate what it is that we are willing to give our life for. And in the, in the sense of becoming a Christian, that's really what we have to do. You know, we don't call it giving your life to Christ for no reason. We call it giving your life to Christ because that's exactly what we do when we become a Christian. We recognize that we're a sinner. We ask Jesus to forgive us of those sins, and then we give our life to him. It's as if, like Paul said, we're dying to ourselves so that we might live for Christ. I wonder, as a disciple, would we be willing to go the distance that Joseph did? Are, are we even willing to give up something we enjoy for the cause of Christ? Much less would we die for the cause of Christ? And so we need to uh, understand from our story this morning that standing up for Jesus is important even if it involves great personal risk. But also I think the second characteristic we see in the story from Joseph is that to live God's purpose in our circumstances <laughs> is, is paramount to who we are. Let's read in verse 58. 
Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Now there's some things we learn about Joseph in this, this passage that um, is implied. It's not specifically explicit in, in what's said here, but we can clearly know that he's rich. Matthew told us that. He also had this hand hewn tomb that he had made for himself, which is, you know, literally people going in and carving out a tomb in a rock for us. So we know that he is in a powerful political position. We know that it, at a whim, basically, he can get an audience with Pilate. That's, that's pretty significant. We also know from the implication of this passage that he is very concerned about the proper burial of Jesus. He wanted propriety in this burial. He wanted to see that Jesus was afforded a proper burial. And so he did what was necessary. He went to Pilate and asked for the body where most of them, as I said before, would have been tossed into the dump and burned with the trash. He went to Pilate and asked and Pilate clearly agreed with him in this case and gave him the body and ordered it to be so. He took supplies that he needed to do. And by the way, this was not, this was not prominent Jewish religious leader work. This was work that was generally tasked off to someone else, primarily because to touch a, a dead body made you ceremonially unclean. And, and so as Joseph took care of Jesus, he literally made it where he could not celebrate the Passover uh, because of Jewish law. And so he pre-planned, he prepared, he gave up his own um, significant celebration just because he thought Jesus needed a proper burial. He was wealthy enough to have this private tomb. Now, most people didn't get a private tomb. They were stored together in, in large caves. And, and yet Joseph had had one made for himself that was private. And he turned around and showed his generosity by giving it away. Now there's, there's a piece of me that kind of wonders, well, did he know? Did he know that in three days Jesus would vacate his tomb and he knew this was a temporary situation? There was Jesus checking into a hotel and checking out. I don't know what Joseph knew for sure, but I know for a fact that he was generous enough that it should it be permanent. As, as a disciple of Christ, he was willing to give up his most valued prized possession. You know, all of us have a set of circumstances in which we live. Joseph's were unique. His position, everything about him just screamed that he would not be a follower of Christ, and yet he was. Everything um, he did following the crucifixion of Christ on the cross says that he loved Jesus with all his heart. We have circumstances in which we live, and some of those circumstances even orchestrated by God himself and and they're designed to help us understand who we are and who we are in Christ his purpose God's purpose his scope his design all of that plays into the circumstances in which we live and whether we're rich or poor or strong or weak or young or old really doesn't matter it is just part of our circumstances in which we live and sometimes our circumstances make it hard to be a disciple of Christ the way Joseph was a disciple of Christ and so living God's purpose in our circumstances while difficult has got to be one of those things as a disciple we should strive for in every moment. And then finally in verse 61, I think I find the trait that I would simply say, don't give up. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Now it doesn't say a whole lot. It maybe, maybe it's a stretch for me to say, you know, that says don't give up, but it doesn't say what Mary and Mary were doing, but it, 
it doesn't take a rocket scientist to try to figure out at least a little bit of how they felt. They have just watched Jesus crucified on a cross. Nobody stood up for him. Joseph took care of him after the fact. He, uh, I, I say no one stood up for him. Joseph stood up for him. But the, the, the magnitude of the event that they have just witnessed, as they sat opposite this tomb, it's clear to me that they were mourning now, it doesn't say that explicitly in the scripture, but it also doesn't say that they were standing there ecstatically waiting for his arrival, you know, his return. But, you know, they were probably mourning. It's important to know that they were there. They didn't just let Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body and put it in a tomb. They followed. They went. They, they did what people do when you have a funeral and mourn in that day. And, and they they went there and sat there this is over I, it again it's one of those situations where it's hard to completely understand what was going on in their heads but maybe it's not all that hard to imagine jesus is dead this is over it's done it's finished the grave was so permanent to them or were they sitting there thinking you know I, I watched as Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I watched the miracles that he performed. And, and was there some anticipation that they, as they sat there? I'm sure that there was a measure of confusion and stunned loss. But sitting at the tomb, I wonder if they thought about the sign of Jonah. You see, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus was talking to a group. In fact, it says, as the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. I wonder if they thought about those three days. You know, this was a popular um, teaching in Jewish life anyway, the they understood the, the sign of Jonah. They understood the repentance that was necessary for the Ninevites and, and how Jonah spent three days in the belly of that well and then emerged and preached <laughs> 40 days and Nineveh shall be no more. And, and uh, the Ninevites all repented in sackcloth and ash and turned from their wicked ways and accepted God's salvation. And so I, I wonder if they sat there and thought of that. Had they heard Jesus say that they would get the sign of Jonah? Had they understood that Jesus would enter this tomb and in three days arise? I, all of that plays into the idea that we are to never give up. They followed Jesus to what they thought or may have thought was the very end. Never giving up. And those of us that know the rest of the story, those of us that that know next Sunday, or this Sunday following this event, they're gonna be back. They have come to the tomb and they find Jesus missing. But you see, giving up is giving in. And Jesus calls his followers to never give in, never give up. There's a story I, I love to tell about a hymn writer. Her name was Frances Jane Crosby. People knew her as Fanny Crosby. She truly captured the American gospel song movement, if you want to call it that. She, she wrote more than 8,000 gospel song texts in her lifetime. Her hymns have been, still are sung more than any other hymns that you find in churches today. Her favorites have been an important part of evangelical worship for the last hundred years. It's amazing that anyone, not to mention a person who was blind, could overcome that kind of disability and write such a variety of spiritual truths and experiences in a musical kind of way. For a considerable part of her life, she was under contract with a music publishing company and, and she wrote as many as three new hymns every week. She used over 200 pen names as she wrote these hymns. There's a, a lot of her original texts that are still being discovered and, and possibly could be published or even set to music 
again. I, at times, a, a preacher would stop by or a minister and, and they would sit down with Fanny and say, listen, I need a hymn that talks about this spiritual truth. And, and she would write the hymn. Sometimes musicians would write a tune and they would bring the tune to Fanny and say to her, here, can you put some words to this song? And, um, and so she would. Some of the most well-known hymns you'll probably recognize, Blessed Assurance, All the Way My Savior Leads Me and Rescue the Perishing. <laughs> she died at 95 years old and engraved on her tombstone are the words taken from Jesus' remarks to Mary, the sister of Lazarus. <laughs> she hath done what she could. Man. When we read in Matthew chapter 27 of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and where he gave everything he was for our salvation, where he bore our sin, where he paid the price, we kind of have to ask ourselves, have we even done what we could? Much less would we be a disciple, a follower, who followed Jesus even unto death. So I say to us, let's not give up. Let's never give up. What Jesus calls us to is a life of following him. And as sure as he arose on that third day, he's coming again. And when he comes again, he's going to gather his church home. Don't you want to be a part of that? All that we need to do is receive the salvation that he has to offer us. This coming week, as we prepare for Resurrection Sunday, I pray that you'll think about what it is to be a disciple. What is your dedication? What is your commitment to Christ? What will it look like? Especially this week. Invite somebody to church. Invite someone to join you in a Bible study. Invite somebody to watch this with you. I don't, I don't, I don't care. But we need to be telling people about Jesus. We need to show our discipleship. The way Joseph of Arimathea showed his, the way Mary and Mary showed theirs, the way those that never gave up showed their commitment to Christ. Let's show ours together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the, the time we've had together. I pray that you be with us as we prepare for Resurrection Sunday, that you would give us um, strength this week to live as a disciple of your son, Jesus. Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. Glad you joined me. Look forward to seeing you next time. You can join us here on Facebook or you can or YouTube, or either one, you can uh, join us in person. We'll be at Darty Baptist Church this coming Sunday on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday morning, Lord willing, and um, we will have a special time together. Look forward to seeing you. Have a great week.